AI is a powerful tool. This summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values. Welcome to AI for Good the leading action-oriented, global and inclusive United Nations platform on AI. Organized by ITU, in partnership with 40 UN sister organizations, and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and scale those solutions for global impact. In today's session, we're counting on you to use the live video wall feature to ask questions and post comments to help create an engaging discussion. We encourage you to stay until the end to chat, connect, ask questions, and network with our distinguished panelists and world-class AI experts in the neural network. It is now time to kick off the session and welcome our first speaker. The floor is yours. Yes, welcome also from my side uh, to this webinar series AI for Earth and Sustainability Science. And it's my pleasure that um, today I can introduce two experts and bring together uh, physical modeling uh, with machine learning from different perspectives. It's Lorazana and Patrick Gallinari. And uh, we start today with, with Lorazana. So we have two, two talks, uh, a long, long session day, but I'm sure a very exciting session. And let me introduce first Lorazana, and then after her talk, we can have a few uh, questions and answers. And after that, we continue with Patrick's presentation again with questions and answers. And afterwards, maybe we can have a broader discussion depending on how the timing also goes, or in the neural network, uh, network afterwards. So Laura Sana is professor in mathematics um, and atmosphere ocean science at the Current Institute, New York University. Her research focuses on the dynamics of the climate system, and the main emphasis of her work is to study the influence of the ocean on local and global scales. She was a recipient of quite uh, some prestigious award from the American uh, Meteorological Society. Um, and what is probably most important for uh, today is that she's actually lead principal investigator of the NSF and NOAA um, climate process team on ocean transport and eddy energy, uh, which is an international effort uh, to improve climate models with scientific machine learning, which is actually this kind of series is also about. So I'm looking forward very much to, Laura, to your talk. Thank you very much, Marcus, for uh, the invitation and the introduction, and thanks everybody for joining uh, the session. So I'm 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 very excited uh, to talk about you know uh, our recent work that is very collaborative as part of multiple large scale efforts on really using you know AI and machine learning to improve climate models. And so you know my my title as a as a question mark right is it hype or is it reality? So I think we're very much at the beginning of this kind of you know uh, transformation of of you know, our approach to climate modeling and, and, and thinking about how AI and machine learning in general can help us, uh, you know, move forward. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an outline, as Marcus mentioned, you know, with a couple of talks which are a little bit on the long side. I'm going to 
try to remain relatively high level um, and kind of, you know, tell you a little bit about, you know, how we use climate models for making climate change projections, which is very much where I'm coming from. And so trying to tell you a little bit, you know, how useful climate models are, uh, also how we use them, but also some of the challenges we are facing with the current generation of climate model. And what I'm going to do is, is really kind of introduce a way uh, of reimagining the way we capture a lot of the physics that is missing in the current generation of climate models. And we're going to do that with data, lots of data, uh, simulated data, uh, for which you know, we can actually have uh, some kind of abundance of and use machine learning and, and artificial intelligence to try to capture the essence or the physics of, of those processes that we don't resolve. And you know, I'm going to try to conclude with with a few you know recent uh, work uh, in which we actually use machine learning to improve our you know current generation of climate model. And and again, it remains with a question mark, right? Are the models better? Are are we improving projections? And you know, th this is very much the beginning of an effort, and it's part of you know two projects that I'm very privileged to be part of. One is M Square Nine, which is funded by Schmidt Futures, uh, and the other one is a new science and technology center out of Columbia. Uh, funded by NSF. So both of those projects very much are thinking about new ways, uh, you know, to improve climate models and projections with scientific machine learning. So today I'm going to present a lot of work that comes out of M squared lines, uh, but the philosophy applies as well to a lot of the work that we're doing within Leap. Okay, so as Marcus mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm an oceanographer, what we call an oceanographer, so I try to understand how the oceans work and how it works as part of the climate system. So as most of you probably know by now, right, we are emitting a lot of, of uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, and a lot of that, a lot of those greenhouse gases actually uh, leads to an excess energy in the climate system. Now, most of that excess energy actually ends up in the ocean. And this is what you see in this graph here, which is the energy change in the climate system as a function of time. And so what you can see is that those kind of blue bars are where most of the energy accumulates in the climate system. And it accumulates in the ocean. So more than 90% of the excess energy in the climate system due to you know, greenhouse gases actually is being absorbed by the ocean. And of course, that has some consequences, right? Um, sea level is going to rise uh, because you know, water expands as it warms, but we also change the transport in the ocean and the way we actually you know, move around tracers and so on. So that's definitely big consequences for the climate system in general. So let's look at patterns, right? So this is a kind of a data reconstruction here of, you know, a, patterns of warming. So the oceans is warming, but it's not warming at the same rate everywhere. It's warming at different rates in different places. Uh, you can see some hot spots where a lot of the heat is being taken up in the Southern Ocean and in the North Atlantic, for example. And so really understanding the physics, uh, you know, behind that, that, you know, that those processes is actually pretty important. And understanding the physics is also important for what might happen in the future. But it's not enough, right? We can't just wave our hand and try to understand the physics and have enough information to predict what the future would look like. To understand what the, our future might look like, and again, from a perspective of, of the ocean, we use climate simulators, right? So we use climate models, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how they work. But again, just to uh, give you a little bit of the feel, so this is you know warming over here again on the vertical axis as a function of time. The, you know, this part over here, where it's called observation and hybrid, is, is basically some kind of measurement-based um, ocean warming that we have. So now the black curve is actually what simulators give us. Um, and again, you know, we can start early in the days. And, and again, they, they reproduce a pretty good amount of warming, quite similar to the observations. When going to the future, then the story is a little bit different. In the future, there is one piece that we need to prescribe, which is how much we will emit. And so each one of those colored curve is a different, uh, you know, possible future with a different amount of warming. Now there is shading in around each one of those curves. And the reason for that is we have climate models. We impose some kind of emissions, but each model is a little bit different. Each climate simulator is a little bit different. So each one of them is actually giving a slightly different amount of warming if we go into the 21st century. And the question is why, right? Why are our climate models giving kind of different answers? And so I'm going to try to take you through how climate models work and how we use them or how we build them. So the good news for us, at least, is we have equations, right? So we have partial differential equations that actually governs, you know, the, they are basically the laws of physics 
that governs how you know motions happen in the ocean, same for the atmosphere. So, you know, this basically are quite complicated nonlinear partial differential equations that I'm not gonna go through, but we have a set of them. One which kind of basically is, you know, our Newton's law, but for fluids, so it's quite complicated. It depends on the rotation of the planets, you know, and a bunch of other things which make it quite nonlinear and, and, and pretty tricky and quite turbulent. Uh, and then we have additional equation, mass conservation, heat conservation, salt, and then an equation of state that relates density to temperature and salt and pressure in the ocean. So a large set of complex nonlinear equations that actually govern all the scales uh, in the oceans. So here I'm talking about the ocean mostly, but the same is, is true for the atmosphere. Now, the problem is we can't really solve those PDs uh, by hand. Right? So the way we do that is we actually take them and we actually chop them into pieces. So we discretize them. And we do that, we can do that in many ways to, you know, you can discretize your equation in different ways, but then you can represent those derivatives and those, you know, each one of those terms in a, basically in a grid box. And you can evolve that as a function of time. So that's really how we build climate model. We take basically our governing laws, we chop them into pieces, and, you know, we try to come up with basically, you know, a representation at every single grid box, box of the climate model that evolves as a function of time. And that will tell us how the flow moves around, how the temperature changes, and so on and so forth. So, you know, a long history of, of you know, numerical methods that go into building climate model. And that has been very, very successful in many applications, not just climate, to be clear. Now, the thing is, the equation that I showed you are complicated, but they also hold across all the times, across all the length scale, right? So here, basically, the ocean currents are basically evolving on, on length scale of thousands of kilometers. But there are a lot of different processes, quite turbulent and quite nonlinear, uh, that go all the way down to a meter scale. And all those processes are actually linked to one another. So a lot of those turbulent features come from instabilities of the large scale flow, but they also re-inject you know, momentum and they also help carrying across you know, different tracers in the ocean. So each one of those you know, processes is actually important, both at local scale but at global scale as well. And, and that's really kind of the crux of, you know, how our climate models are doing a great job at capturing a lot of those features, but also can be limiting because it's actually quite computationally expensive to get this entire range of motion. And just to give you an idea, let me go back for a sec. So just to give you an idea, if I were basically taking, you know, every, all the equation that I showed you before, and assume that we are breaking the world into a one meter cube boxes, right? And have, you know, as many of those covering the ocean, we'll end up with 10 to the 28 equation to solve just for the ocean dynamics. So it's pretty much intractable with, you know, the, the current compute that we have and the current climate generation, the current climate model uh, simulation that we currently have. So huge challenge because it's a huge compute effort to actually go across all those scales. So here are some, you know, simulations of, Coupled climate models, so they add the ocean, the atmosphere, the land, the ice, and so on and so forth. And what you're seeing here is surface temperature in those three different climate simulators in which we took those partial differential equation, we discretized them, uh, but the grid box that we pick has actually different resolutions, so different sizes. So 10 kilometer, and I'm talking only about horizontal resolution, so latitude, longitude, so to speak. So 10 kilometer resolution, 40 kilometer resolution, 100 kilometer resolution. So as you go to the left, basically the grid uh, box size that you have gets larger and larger. And what you can see obviously is that the flow is a lot more viscous, right? So you have something very turbulent on the right-hand side and something rather sluggish and viscous on the left-hand side. So of course, uh, the one on the right-hand side looks prettier because I was able to actually chop you know, uh, the boxes into smaller and smaller pieces so I can resolve more of the turbulence and all the features that I showed you. And I can't when I go to coarser resolution. Now, of course, the movies are prettier, but actually the physics is, is better represented in this kind of fine resolution model because the way you steer and mix the tracer in the ocean has actually a pretty big impact on the rate of ocean heat uptake and the way you melt ice and the way you interact with different scales. So the big question is, okay, I can't run, you know, a typical climate model at 10 kilometer or even finer resolution. So usually we stock at, you know, 40 to 100 kilometer resolution. And that's really the typical resolution of the existing generation of climate models. But that means I'm missing a lot of physics, right? So, and we need to find a way to actually capture 
the physics that is missing in those kind of coarse resolution model uh, in some way. And that's been going on for decades and it's called the parameterization problem. And so the way we do that is, you know, we, we gonna have our climate simulators with a given resolution. So as I mentioned, you know, 40 kilometer or 100 kilometer. And that means that everything that is happening below this grid box size is not being resolved. That means it's not being captured at all. So for the atmosphere, that means turbulence, that means clouds. So, you know, the way you actually have rainfall forming. So all of those processes are actually not resolved in the current generation of climate models. If you go to the ocean, then it's also kind of, you know, similar to some extent. A lot of the processes that here and mixed uh, tracers and temperature in the ocean are also not represented. So a lot of the turbulence in the ocean, both in the upper ocean, in the interior and near, you know, the bottom of the ocean is also not well captured. So the way we've been, you know, doing parameterization for many decades, it's got to come up with a simple mathematical representation of the processes. Say, if you know, you know, you should have some mixing at a certain scale, then you can come up with a mathematical operator, say the Laplacian of temperature, and that will represent mixing. And then you have a coefficient in front of it, I'll tell you the rate of mixing. So it's pretty ad hoc, but it's kind of based on physical intuition with a simple mathematical operator. So your climate model will have, you know, a change of temperature at every single grid box. That is one piece that is resolved. So the full equation that we've discretized and one piece that is a little bit ad hoc that we just come up with. And, you know, it has improved climate model quite drastically. So I don't want to, you know, just criticize it. It's been a phenomenal improvement in many aspects of the climate system, but it continues to actually be, you know, a consider considerable source of uncertainty because there's a lot of the physics that is missing. And sometimes so some, some of those idealized representations are a bit too idealized and don't capture the essence of all the physical processes that are important. So if you look at the symptom of those kind of, you know, missing physics, here is, for example, the surface temperature error between different climate simulations and observations. So it's three different climate models, and you're looking at the error of uh, average sea surface temperature between the observations and the models themselves. And so it's without criticizing anyone, all the models have some errors. And sometimes, you know, some of them are the same in all the models. In the North Atlantic, there's this kind of blue spot uh, that is basically an error of several degrees uh, in sea surface temperature. And quite often this is linked to missing physics. In the ocean, the atmosphere, or actually the coupling. The Southern Ocean is another place where the models are actually struggling uh, to capture um, the right sea surface temperature. And, and again, you know, it's just the fact that we're a little bit limited by compute and by the resolution, and the fact that we are missing some physics and it's not necessarily well represented. If you look at projections of climate change, as we discussed before, the ocean is gonna warm, the rate at which it's gonna warm will depend on the models. So here are our maps of ocean warming uh, coming out of you know, a, a suite of climate models. And you can see the ocean will warm as we double CO2 into the future. Doesn't warm everywhere at the same rate as we discussed before because the ocean is doing you know, different things at different, in different region. But then if we look at the spread, so basically how different the different projections are, then different models give you different answers. For example, again, the North Atlantic has a large spread. And the spread, again, comes from a different formulation of the climate models themselves, and in particular, the parameterizations of ocean mixing and turbulence. So the way we take up the heat, the way we steer it, and the way we move it around the oceans is actually one of the main reasons that we see this kind of spread in our projections of ocean war. So with M squared lines, what we've been thinking about is, can we actually try to reduce the uncertainty in those you know, sea surface temperature errors and in the spread of ocean heat uptake and other quantities by using machine learning to rethink the way we do parameterization. So it's a large collaboration. Um, you know, there are quite a few of us now. I, I stopped counting, but you know, we are about uh, 40 people across many institutions that try to rethink the way we do the parameterization problem for the ocean, uh, the ice, and the atmosphere. And so the idea is, can we leverage a lot of the data sets that we have, which are usually high resolution simulation, high fidelity simulation, with new algorithm coming out of you know, machine learning uh, to try to rethink the way we do this unresolved physics parameterization. So rather than coming up with an ad hoc way to represent say ocean mixing or clouds in the atmosphere, let's try to actually ask the data. Simply take the data and with machine learning algorithm, ask, you know, basically ask the question of what should be the best representation 
of those you know, turbulent processes that we can go and plug into climate models uh, that might be more faithful uh, to the physics uh, that we believe in. So, you know, this kind of idea of reimagining parameterization from data and, and machine learning is actually not that new. Um, so in the atmosphere, I actually started in the late 90s and kind of, you know, there was a 10 year gap and then kind of slightly reemerged. And as I mentioned, LEAP, for example, the Science and Technology Center is actually doing a lot of work on trying to rethink parameterization, especially for land atmosphere, um, you know, and other components of the air system. We've been focusing a lot on the ocean. So again, this idea of how mixing and turbulence can actually affect ocean warming has been a big part of our work. And this is what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of this talk. But I want to give you a little bit of my philosophy on this. Or I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I, because it's a long talk, so it's, I'm not going to go into every single detail of what we do. But I, I really want to give you a flavor of the way we're thinking about the problem, uh, or at least the way I think about the problem. So if you develop parameterization in general, again, the traditional way has been we come up with an operator with a given parameter. So here on the x-axis, I have complexity as the number of free parameters that you're learning. Now, if I you know, go after what I mentioned before, which is let's use machine learning and lots of data, then you will be on the right-hand side of this axis. With deep learning, you have a bazillion number of parameters and you're just trying to fit the data as well as possible, right? And this kind of huge number of free parameter gives you the flexibility to capture highly nonlinear processes that are extremely complex that you wouldn't with a super simple mathematical operator with a simple parameter. And I think that's really the power of deep learning uh, is this flexibility of you know, having a lot of free parameters, but also learning the best combinations uh, across different input features. But again, means that you know, your model becomes more and more complex than something that you would want. Now, the problem is if you put on the vertical axis the error, right? So again, the error of a traditional closure when you have a simple mathematical operator with one parameter is probably going to be pretty high, as opposed to deep learning, where again, you're going to have a lot of flexibility so that your error can go down. So it really gives you that freedom of, of adapting as much as you want. So I'm going to show you some example of you know, how to learn from you know, parameterization of ocean turbulence, which is important for steering and mixing tracers in the ocean and what we call energize the large scale. It's, it's basically a phenomenon in, in, in stratified fluids that you can move energy from the small scale to the large scale and basically kind of intensify the currents and the large scale. And it's super important actually for heat uptake and transport in general. So that's why we focus on that. So I'm going to show you a little bit how we can use data to learn the you know, missing physics from a coarse resolution model for that specific kind of mesoscale feature. What we do is we take basically data from you know, one of the high resolution simulation that I showed you earlier. Um, it's again, kind of a data set that was kindly provided by our colleagues at GFDR Princeton that run a full you know, coupled climate model at 10 kilometer resolution. So lots of data for us to use. And what we ask the algorithm is to actually try to learn a representation of the missing turbulence uh, from a coarse resolution climate model given input features from those four regions. Input features are going to be surface velocities, which is basically you know, something about the transport at coarse resolution. I'm going to ask it to learn what should be the true forcing that the coarse resolution simulation is missing compared to a high resolution truth. Just to make it clear, we remain at coarse resolution. We're only looking for something that is missing at coarse resolution. We're not trying to do super resolution. So we're really looking for a force to put on the right hand side of an equation at coarse resolution. And you can do it in many ways, right? So CNN is a, a perfect way to capture, you know, something that has a lot of spatial, uh, you know, scale or a lot of you know, kind of special correlations. Um, and what we've done here is to, rather than use a kind of a traditional loss function of, of mean square error, we use a negative log likelihood. So that means by, you know, assuming that we have a Gaussian PDF at each point, we can learn the conditional probability of the missing turbulent forcing on the surface velocity. And so we learn this kind of missing forcing as a probability, uh, which gives us, um, you know, basically a mean and a standard deviation for that missing forcing. So now, how does it look like, right? So here is just one example. We have quite a few to show. So we learn on only four regions, and we see if we can actually generalize to the rest of the globe on one part of the data set that 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 we didn't use. So here is the R squared. Um, so the R squared just you know, gives us a measure of the scale, right? So basically the uh, residual squared over the total residual. So if you're blue, that means you know, it's about 50% scale. 
uh, if it's kind of darkish, so it's one, so 100%, so we do quite well. In the majority of regions, you can see actually the neural net was, was extremely good at capturing you know, the missing physics uh, you know, from a given course resolution model. At high latitude, it does poorly in general. Um, and actually, it was not hugely surprising as we only train it on regions that was capturing only ocean turbulence. And those high latitude regions are actually more characteristic of ocean ice interaction, for example, or ocean atmosphere coupling. And so the, you know, if you don't give your algorithm the right data, then it's not gonna necessarily gonna learn the right pattern. Or if it does, it might be by accident. So here, you know, nothing hugely surprising, something that you see in every single machine learning application is it will learn very, very well complex features. It can generalize pretty well as long as it sees the right data. And places where it doesn't, then that's why it does more poorly. But it was still very encouraging for us that on very limited sampling and very limited amount of data, we can actually really capture the majority of the missing forcing from you know, course resolution simulation, giving us you know, some hope uh, that this could improve in, in traditional, you know, as opposed to traditional parameterization, um, which I'll show you a little bit later, it does. But the disadvantage of this method is interpretability. Okay, so we had our kind of two axes of error versus complexity. The larger number of parameters that I have, the easier it is to capture, you know, complex features. But the problem is it's very hard to interpret anything that's coming out of the neural network. Just too many parameters for us to figure out. So interpretability actually sadly goes down when you increase the number of parameters. So we've been exploring a kind of a different kind of a different route, right? Which is equation discovery. So here, trying to think about something that is sparse enough so that you have very few parameters. And at the same time, you actually have expressions that might make sense. It's not obvious that it would, but it might make sense, or at least a bit easier to interpret uh, when you have a mathematical operator, especially when you come from you know, kind of the physics world where we describe everything with equations. So you know, we, it's kind of a little bit of a you know, perfect in-between way where you, know, you, you still ask the data what should be the best model. Uh, but you have an expression that might be easy to, to interpret. So we started you know, a few years ago, and it's kind of this reference here is Anna Bolton with Tom Bolton, was a, a PhD student in my group, by using um, you know, basically uh, a, a library of functions. So kind of a sparse regression idea where you fill the algorithm, a library of function, and you try to learn an equation based on that library of function. It was quite successful. I'll, I'll show you some results in a bit. But the disadvantage of that methods is that you know you you're only kind of basically constrained by the size of the library that you give, and also it requires you to pre-compute everything ahead of time. So recently we started kind of a new idea, which is based on genetic programming, where now it's a pure kind of symbolic regression, right? You still try to capture you know as a, a sparse representation of the missing physics. Uh, but you can be as deep as you want because you basically start with some random seed, you build trees, and you actually start, you know, based on, you know, the whatever input features and whatever output, uh, find the best expression that will match the data set that you're looking for. So we took genetic programming, GP Learn, that is, you know, already existing and, and has a nice, you know, kind of API, and we kind of changed it a little bit. We introduced spatial derivatives because those algorithms usually don't really uh, deal with physics data. Where you have special derivatives, so we kind of, you know, uh, integrated that. We um, also did it as an iterative sparse regression, because usually this kind of method is is really good at capturing the first, you know, two terms in a very robust fashion. So when you restart it, you always end up with the same expression. But the deeper you go, the more sensitive it's going to be to the initial condition or the random seeds. So by doing it as a iterative sparse regression on residual, it, it gives us, you know, forms that are a lot more robust. Uh, as, as you restart your sampling. And we had a little bit of a, what we call a human in a loop intervention, which is just our way to say sometime when the algorithm was doing something silly, uh, like adding terms that have different units, we just you know stopped it or something that didn't make much sense. So that's a, a little bit of a, you know us kind of putting this in as a safeguard. So what was exciting is we could actually come up with an expression um, that had you know basically different terms uh, in terms of a quantity that is called potential vorticity. That is a very nice way to combine dynamics and thermodynamics in the ocean and, and a beautiful way to interpret it as well. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but it basically was capturing the way we do steering and mixing and the way we re-inject energy at large scale. 
in this case, based on a given data set, we're actually able to learn you know, a mathematical expression for it. So now let's try to see how it does, right? In a very idealized setup, we have basically three different models. One that is a physics-based closure, one parameter, one that is a deep learning with many parameters. I can't remember how deep it was, but it was you know, pretty deep um, for a simple system. And one that is a data-driven sparse regression so with a few parameters. And what we're trying to do is to take a coarse resolution model and then on the right hand side, I have a forcing for term that is either of those three parameterization and hope to recover the same physics as the high resolution, as long as you're in a coarse way. So, you know, I mean, if I look at those snapshots here, those images, it all looks good, right? They all seem to do a decent job. If I look at the amount of kinetic energy as a function of time, then, you know, the neural network in terms of its level does, does actually kind of the best ish, especially also in the probability distribution of the turbulence itself. The equation discoveries and the physics-based one are somewhere in between, right, for the PDF, and about right for the amount of kinetic energy. So depending on the metric that you're looking at, one might do better than the other, but, you know, kind of similarly, you know, they, they all do relatively well. Now, the question is, technically, it's the same physics that I should, that I'm capturing that should work if I were taking the same partial differential equations and change a little parameter in it. And so, for example, one parameter that we like to change in fluids and stratified fluids is the rotation of the Earth, or at least the way it changes as a function of latitude that kind of moves you to different places of the globe or to different planets. So here, if we change a, a little parameter, then and the PDs are the same, then you can end up with a simulation that has jets rather than just pure turbulence. And at coarse resolution, again, because you don't capture all the physics, the jets are weaker, there's less turbulence. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this low resolution model. And again, we're going to plug in the physics based parameterization. So one parameter and an expression, the deep learning one and the equation discovery. So this was not retrained. This was not retuned. This was only learned from those kind of high resolution simulations here as kind of the missing term. And here's what you get. For the physics based one, there's almost no change. It seems like it didn't do all that much. The deep learning one does a terrible job actually it tries to almost break all the jets that it has, while the you know, sparse regression, very few parameter, just a few mathematical expression, actually does quite well overall. And this is something that we've seen across many, many metrics, not just those snapshots. The sparse model is actually able to capture the essence of the physics and can generalize well to many different regimes without even seeing you know, new data set. And actually, it's probably because it's sparse and it doesn't try to overfit to the data. And so it's really there to capture the essence of the physics rather than trying to get the best R squared, you know, either offline and then does a better job when you go to different dynamical regimes online. And that's very important for us, right? We're trying to learn some missing physics rather than just some kind of empirical relationship. And so that was quite, you know, quite exciting for us. So I want to give you kind of a few words of, you know, kind of summary, and then I'm going to spend, you know, a few minutes showing you some results in global simulation and just close. Um, so. One thing that you know, we are pretty confident is that parameterization of unresolved processes will still be in demand for many decades to come. Uh, even though we increase resolution and now we have GPUs, so some people are rewriting climate models that are faster, you know, for us to go all the way down to the one meter scale you know, and all the way up to thousands of kilometers for ensemble prediction is probably not going to happen anytime soon. Oh, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I feel we still have, have quite some time to go. And, and so, you know, trying to think about way to parameterize and resolve processes will remain kind of a, a big, a big important step. But it's also another way for us to understand this, the climate system across scales and across mediums as well. So I feel data, you know, data driven approaches and machine learning can really help us, you know, get closer to those goals, better understanding and better improvement in climate models. I showed you two kind of example. One is deep learning. So it's highly flexible, right? When you have complex data, high skill. Is it generalizable? Is it transferable? Is it interpretable? It's really hard to tell, right? So, you know, I always say there's a lot of noise, uh, and I, I mean it both figuratively and 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 and, and really, uh, in a sense that a lot of people are using, you know, machine learning and deep learning, and and we find something, but it's hard to see if it actually translates across many problems, at least for the physics problems. So I think it's all a lot of question marks, but nonetheless, super exciting, and we continue using deep learning. I'm a little bit, you know, biased, um, you know, as a kind of a trained climate physicist, 
the equation discovery gives me something that really tries to poke at problem in a simple way. Uh, and, you know, has the potential of discovering new physics or chemistry or interactions between process. Now, it's not obvious that we'll learn something that actually makes sense. Sometimes we learn equations that they don't make sense at all, but kind of gives us a, a different way to look at the problem. Now, there are many challenges ahead, right? Which questions to ask is always the big one, right? You don't want to work on a problem that nobody works on. And then how do you interpret the results? You know, which data to trust? You know, how do you make use of observations? And, the, you know, many of those points, I'm going to come back to it in a minute. But I want to show you how do we move towards reliable simulations and projections, which was kind of my main point. I showed you idealized experiment, but, you know, for us, the end game are real climate models. So the first thing we did is we actually went to idealized climate models, so meaning the code of a climate model, but in an idealized setup, so we can try things out and see what works and what breaks. So here we're looking at fish of right from an ocean model, it's called MOM6. So it's the ocean component of the GFDL Princeton climate model and also the NCAR uh, climate model. So two big you know, uh, climate models that are being used in, in different assessments uh, and kind of state of the art. This is a coarse resolution model. This is a truth. So this is where we want to be. And we want to take the coarse resolution model and add our learned parameterization from data. So now they're not retrained. They're just taken from you know, what I showed you before. One is a neural network. One is an equation discovery one, and we plug them in those course resolution models. So, you know, we were quite excited in both instances. Those data driven closures actually improve the flow. So, here it's the surface height, but they improve other parts of the flow, kind of remove this kind of weird, uh, you know, features over here. The jets get stronger. The flow is actually more realistic without the computational cost of, you know, running a 132nd of a degree model. Now, that's the good news. So, everything is improved. The bad news is there were a problem with numeric sensitivity. So it's actually not new. Most parameterizations have those kind of problems. But here it's sometimes a little bit harder to track where it comes from. Does it come from the data? Does it come from the implementation or all those kind of aspects? Calibration and tuning, we had to actually kind of manually trick, you know, uh, the way we implemented those parameterizations to kind of uh, calm their effects in, in certain places. And of course, the computational cost and the infrastructure. So interestingly, most climate models are actually written in Fortran, which, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, and our, for example, deep learning, you know, models are in Python. So, you know, interfacing between those two can be quite a challenge. And of course, the larger your network, the more computationally expensive it's going to be to actually do the inference and going between GPU, CPUs. For the equation discovery, it's actually a lot easier because there's nothing to do. It's just a simple code. Uh, for which you can discretize your equation, figuring out the numerics. So there are plenty of challenges ahead. Some are quite new on the infrastructure. Some are actually extremely old, uh, but kind of, you know, we're rethinking them again. But that still does not stop us. We're still going, you know, full swing with global simulations that are on the way. So here's one of them. So here it's actually changing the vertical diffusivity in, uh, in a simulation. So here is uh, basically a temperature profile as a function of depth in the equator. This is the observation, and you can see that the model is doing some kind of you know, weird things in the upper ocean, doesn't have quite the right magnitude in its temperature. So uh, what uh, our colleague at Princeton did is to actually take the same physics closure that they had and only replace with a you know, machine learned uh, you know, kind of method, a neural network in this case, only the diffusivity profile, which is the part that was completely ad hoc in the parameterization. And by doing that, then they remove some of the kind of the spurious errors that they wear at the surface over here. They get a better vertical structure of the temperature compared to the observations. So they kept the physics part that was right, which was conserving energy, and they replaced the part that was completely ad hoc, which was the eddy diffusivity, which is the way you diffuse, uh, you know, tracer in the upper ocean. Uh, in the vertical in this case. So kind of, you know, something in between where you keep whatever is right on the physics and you replace whatever is ad hoc. And what's exciting is now they were able to do global runs. So here's a, you know, a neural, neural ne network, you know, emulation of what we call the mixed layer depth, which is the depth of the layer that is well mixed in the upper ocean. You know, the simulation is stable. It does, you know, better than it did before in, in quite a few regions of the ocean. So this is quite exciting, you know, for us. And this is a way for us to use true data to improve simulation. Now, there's another path 
that we've been using, and that's kind of a little bit where I want to close with, is that we haven't made use of observations at all. And it's hard because quite often we don't have enough good data. But what we have is something that is called data assimilation. So data assimilation is you take your course resolution model and you correct it with observations. Now that corrections in this kind of this path over here, that correction is actually an indication of the error in your model. And the question is, can we learn, learn those corrections and can they be used in the future for which you have no observations? And here's an example now, not for the ocean, but for sea ice concentration, again, by colleagues at Princeton GFDL, uh, where they try to actually learn this kind of correction of the model, which is kind of this, you know, uh, little jump that you see every every five days in, in an ocean uh, sea ice coupled simulation and try to machine learn that correction and see if you implement it back in the model over a time for which you have, you know, not making use of the object version at all, are you actually correcting the model at all? And here is uh, what they're showing here. That's the error in the sea ice concentration that you start with. That's where if you were correcting it with the observation that you have, and that's if you correct it with the neural network without making use of the current time observation. And what you can see in those graphs is that, you know, the model is not quite you know, where the observation should be, but the neural net is actually correcting for it. And so that's quite exciting for us because it's a way to use observations of the past to try to actually make improvement in a model for the future. And we see it's actually doing a, a pretty decent job. Now, of course, there are many challenges ahead, but this is kind of a new and an exciting result that tries to do this blending of observations and models. So there are many, many more challenges that I haven't talked about, but they're always talked about. So that's why I kind of you know forget about them, but they're super important. Which data are you gonna use? Which method you're gonna use? Sometimes it's not, you know, the fanciest is not the best necessarily, depending on the problem that you have. And if you want to improve climate models, uncertainty quantification is actually pretty critical. And for us, we're really trying to improve existing climate models. So that means we want to capture the right physics that is missing. So we really need to generalize across many, many things and many regimes and many planets. So let me close with a few thoughts, uh, you know, and an outlook. So first one is a quote. I mean, it's going to be three quotes. First one, Samuel Carline, right? So the purpose of model is not to feed the data, but to sharpen the question. And even though everything I showed you here was to use data to actually get an answer, I saw it as a way to poke at old problems and helping solving new ones sometimes. So it's one tool out of many. And that's really kind of the next step, which is, you know, again, another quote from George Box, right? So all models are wrong, some are useful. And this is the way I see, you know, machine learned model or AI in general as an additional tool, as an additional model for us to actually think about the problems and really push the boundaries of how we do climate modeling in general uh, and climate projections in the future. So it's really one of the tools as part of a hierarchy. And then, you know, Last quote, um, you know, which is, you know, I haven't, uh, I have uh, yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when looked at in the right way did not become still more complicated. That's very much the way I feel about, you know, climate science and modeling in general. So I'm, you know, very privileged to be part of very, two very large efforts, so LEAP and M squared lines, where we really try to look at this complexity and try to improve, you know, models in general. There are many other projects that are coming up, including from industry, right, NVIDIA, Google Research, and, and Prima. You know, all of them are also trying to tackle those problems. I don't know what the future will look like, how AI will come into play. So I always joke around, maybe a chat GPT or about for climate and weather. I don't think so. I think there's still plenty of physics that is needed, but AI will play a role somehow, somewhere. It's gonna be interesting to see how it is. Just wanna close with that. So I wanna show a picture of all my colleagues who have contributed to the majority of the results that I showed here uh, and happy to take any questions now or later. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks a lot for this very, very nice uh, perspective, including results and uh, also at the same time some some general uh, conclusions that I actually agree very much with. But uh, so I think the idea is that we can have a few questions uh, now, um, maybe mostly on uh, some, some maybe understanding or clarification and then uh, then Patrick's talk. So, and I see here two questions in the chat. Maybe we take these two, and if there's another one coming, we can take a third one, but then we probably go on. So the first one is from Navangshu Senior, and uh, is asking 
what kind of human intervention is required in the genetic programming approach and how often was it uh, required? So it's, yeah, mm -hmm. I think you had yeah. a question. Great, great question. Yeah, thank you very much. So for us, it was a bit of, almost of a safety guard as a kind of a physics way. Um, so you don't have to use it at all if you don't want to. For us, it was mostly, you know, again, when the algorithm was, you know, adding two quantities that should not be added because they have different units. So if you didn't normalize properly, then, you know, it's something you don't want to do. Or it's sometimes capturing terms that we know have actually zero effect, you know, on the physics, because again, it's, it's still learning patterns. So, so that was, you know, one of the key things. Um, and so it depends on what we were going after, the number of times that we used it. Um, but, you know, we, we have terms that we kept and some that we removed. So we try to be as open as possible, but it's very much problem dependent. Yeah, it's a very good question. Thanks. Um, next one is from Peter Watson asking, how stable are the simulations with the parameterization found with the equation discovery? So how long do they typically run before they crash, <laughs> if they crash at all? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question uh, and a very pertinent one. Yes, I did mention stability was an issue. So uh, quite often the equation discovery because it learns an, equ uh, an equation that is relatively small scale. There might be a buildup of what we call entropy or if you want numerical noise. So, um, and it's something that we have to fight. Um, and the way we're fighting it is actually the way a lot of the current turbulence parameterization work is that we filter the field before we implement them. And then there is absolutely no stability and you use a filter that will be conservative. So it's a very good question and one that everybody faces. And so, so yeah, so for us, our current, our current approach is a, is a filtering of the variables. Okay. And no crashing. <laughs> there's, there's another question that you can probably also read yourself is about, yeah. uh, about material or good resources. Maybe you can just add uh, something that you, comes to your mind in the chat. Um, uh, yes, absolutely. So good resources, actually uh, part of M Square Line, we're writing a Jupyter book, which is already online where we go through the Lawrence 96, which is a very simple two time scale model, where we actually explain how climate model works, how parameterization work, how you can use them for machine learning. So that's kind of a nice little exercise. And we have a couple of other resources that we'll happily uh, share. Great. OK, then we leave Thank it you. at that for now. I hope you can stay and uh, possibly be a part of a yes. discussion after Patrick's talk. Well, Thank you. Great. Great. Um, because then we continue with Patrick Kalinari. I don't know if you want to. Ah, yeah. Hello. There we are. There we are. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, Patrick is a professor at Sorbonne University and distinguished researcher at Criteo AI Lab in Paris. And his research focused for a long time already on statistical learning and deep learning with applications in different fields as semantic data processing, uh, but also complex data analysis. And he initiated actually a few years ago uh, this research topic, uh, which is about physics aware machine learning and co-authored some of the very early work in this um, domain. So he, research, uh, he leads a research group um, at the MLAI, IA, which is a machine learning and information access focused on the statistical learning and deep learning. And he's also been director of the Sopon Computer Lab. And so I guess he will focus now exactly also on that uh, topic of physics uh, aware machine learning. And I'm also looking very much forward. Okay. Thanks a lot, Marcus. So I will share my screen. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Now it's there. It's fine. Yes, it's fine. Okay. So thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation, and thanks uh, everybody who is uh, attending. Okay. So I'm a I'm a machine learning guy. So I will try to tell uh, well more or less uh, the same story uh, as Rob, but uh, from uh, maybe from from another perspective. Okay. And uh, I will focus on uh, well on the on the on the modeling of uh, the dynamical processes okay and uh, i will uh, i will mainly uh, describe uh, two uh, two topics one consists in the how to incorporate uh, physics knowledge in uh, in 
in machine learning, with machine learning, okay? And the other one concerns the uh, generalization, okay? So this is the outline of, the, of my talk. So I will start by uh, by uh, by talking about uh, some of the of the reasons for the recent successes of uh, of, of machine learning, and then I will uh, introduce uh, the context of this talk, which is uh, AI uh, AI for science, and then uh, go on uh, with the two topics that I just uh, I just just mentioned, and maybe. Depending on, uh, on the time, so if I have time, I will uh, introduce uh, the third uh, some topics we've been working on concerning uh, mesh free approaches for the modeling of, uh, of uh, spatial temporal data. Okay, so let's start <coughs> with uh, with uh, successful applications of uh, application learning. So I'm sure uh, all of you have uh, heard or practiced with uh, these different applications. So what could be said in, uh, in short is that uh, most of these great successes or great demos uh, concern uh, either semantic data analysis or, uh, or games. So typically it's, uh, it's a world of, uh, of, the, of the GAFAs, okay? And uh, so here you have some examples. So let me, I don't know if I can. Okay, well. Yeah, okay. So here you have some, some examples. There's two ones concerns the uh, generation of uh, images. Okay, so none of these images are, are real images or all, uh, all synthetic. So some years ago, people were were creating images with uh, for example, generative adversarial networks, and now you have more you have other techniques that than, uh, than, uh, than, than, than improved uh, the generation. So here this is an example from from days for, for typically uh, for DeepMind and, uh, and Google have been, have been developed a lot of uh, ML applications for, for games. And here's also an application from uh, OpenAI. So for example, here you have the generation of, uh, of uh, images from text. So you just, uh, you just propose some text and, uh, and uh, so the images are, are synthesized from the text. Here, this, this is another application for, 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 for coding. Okay. For, for developing codes in computer science. So it's the same thing, exactly the same idea. It, you, you, will, uh, you will describe what you want to do with uh, just another language and uh, the application will, uh, will develop some, uh, some form of uh, some code, okay? And here you have the way okay, you have ChatGPT, I think everybody heard about it recently, okay? So what I uh, would like to, to introduce is uh, the reasons for for the, the successes and the ingredient of the success? Uh, well, if you if you look at the different applications, okay, they work uh, mainly because uh, there are a lot of uh, of resources, okay, of data, okay, and uh, because uh, they, they are using a, a large uh, large amounts of, uh, of computing power. So here, for example, you have some statistics that corresponds to uh, large language models, typically like, uh, like ChatGPT. So you can see that the, here's a number of parameters for the different models. So there are around hundreds of, uh, of, million, of billion parameters and uh, same thing for, the, for, for the, the training data, okay? So this is for, for language models. You have the same thing for vision. And uh, for example, recently, uh, exactly the same type of models uh, have started to be used for uh, for climate, or maybe uh, more precisely for weather prediction. So here, for example, you have this uh, very recent model that has been published in, uh, at the beginning of this year, the climax model uh, by uh, people from the Microsoft and uh, UCLA, and uh, so they are using exactly the same uh, the same type of, uh, type of models that have been uh, developed for neural language processing. Or different uh, prediction tasks on uh, for, for the prediction or for, for with the prediction. Okay, so I, I don't know exactly what the size of the models or what uh, what the amount of data, but uh, more or less is the same the same amount of, uh, as uh, as for language or main for probably more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another important uh, ingredient uh, for the success of this model, says the models. Is uh, is a software, okay? So well, uh, 
maybe uh, well 10 years ago okay different companies uh, like uh, google or meta facebook at the time uh, started to develop uh, to develop uh, platforms okay for typically dedicated to, to deep learning and uh, make them uh, available for 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 the people. So this changed a lot of things, and uh, this allowed people to develop very complex models. Okay, and these different platforms they rely on optimization tools that are based on automatic differentiation. Okay, so typically uh, it means that uh, more more or less all the, the models that are, are being used uh, in, in deep learning are optimized through uh, some form of uh, gradient algorithms, and this is uh, what uh, this uh, platforms uh, platforms allow. And then there are uh, some companies like, for example, Living Face for, for uh, vision applications and for, for natural language processing that develop code and uh, that may, makes, them, uh, makes them available. Okay, okay so these sub ingredients, uh, the software is extremely, extremely important, for example. Uh, oh, what is the same for? Okay, for example, I will just give, give you an example that has been uh, important uh, for us and for, for many, many people working at the crossroad of uh, physics and uh, machine learning. So typically some, uh, some years ago, uh, people figured out that uh, neural networks could be interpreted as a numerical schemes for solving the things. So it's like this the following. Uh, when you consider neural networks with a very large number of, uh, of layers, okay, so take uh, the unit with an infinite number of layers. The, the neural network itself could be uh, modeled as a, an ordinary differential equation, okay? which means that the dynamics of uh, the neural networks through the different layers can be described by, uh, by an algorithm. And uh, well, so in practice, uh, what, what does it mean? It means that. Uh, Neural networks with a limited, with a fixed uh, number of layers could be interpreted as uh, numerical schemes for solving this kind of problem. And the practical consequence was that it helped to popular, popularize the use of uh, differential numerical solvers for, for the machine learning community. And uh, also, it started the development of uh, solve, differential solvers libraries. That, uh, that were incorporated into the different platforms that uh, I mentioned before. Okay, so this made possible for people like this with the machine learning community to uh, quite easily integrate the uh, physics component modeled by uh, differential equations and machine learning. Uh, machine learning. Okay. And this really, uh, at least for people in, in the people in machine learning, this open, opens the way to, uh, to uh, the development of. Uh, of uh, physics aware. Okay, so now some uh, limitations of, this, uh, of, uh, of machine learning. So it mainly uh, concerns uh, the virtual world, okay? And uh, it relies on uh, several assumptions. And one of the major assumptions is that uh, data should cover all uh, possible situations, okay? Otherwise, this type of uh, algorithm will not uh, generalize to new, to new, to new situations. And uh, typically for physics, while it's much more complex, I think it's way, way more complex than uh, for even for the most, uh, for, for the larger applications I, uh, of machine learning that uh, people have developed up to now. Okay? So physical processes are extremely complex and it's, uh, well, it's more or less uh, impossible. To, to gather data to have uh, just to work on the statistics of, uh, of uh, all the possible situations. Okay. And then uh, another aspect is that, uh, well, either in science or in, in engineering, uh, we have uh, several uh, critical applications, and these applications require uh, both uh, explainability and uh, certification, typically. And uh, also, uh, well, the development of uh, deep learning algorithm remains, uh, well, it remains an, an art. For example, uh, well, if you consider ChatGPT, well, uh, more or less nobody uh, under, really understands uh, why it works and, uh, and how it works. Okay, so it's really based on, the, on, the experiment, on, on an experimental uh, know-how, and, and it offers a few guarantees. Okay. 
and also uh, well, in the same direction, the service not so not so, so developed for for deep learning. So it's uh, it's difficult to, to provide this kind of this platform. Okay. Well, so now what about uh, AI uh, AI for science or the applications of machine learning in science and engineering? So for both uh, both domains, the main paradigm is still the classical paradigm. Okay, Cla uh, classical paradigm, the well, it's classical physical uh, physical paradigm. Okay. Uh, which means that uh, we rely on a deep understanding of uh, the underlying process and then uh, different uh, different modeling steps okay. that allow to do, to describe this uh, to describe this, uh, this process. Okay. And uh, well, so now that uh, data is uh, is uh, really abundant in, uh, in many uh, in many scientific, uh, scientific fields, either data from observations or data from uh, from, uh, from simulations. So big questions are uh, how to make use of uh, AI in this in this different domain, and uh, how is it possible to uh, to you to to to, to develop uh, jointly the classical uh, well, the, the classical uh, physical based parallel together with uh, new machine learning one parallel. Okay. Okay. So it's not this is. Not new, but uh, for deep learning, uh, everything started only a few years ago, and uh, some people start started to, to work on that and, uh, and wrote, uh, for example, prospective papers. So, for, for example, you have this well, nice prospective paper by uh, by Marcus and, and co-authors about the applications of uh, machine learning in, in earth science, and also you have more specific uh, specific papers that uh, appeared later on uh, on uh, the. How to integrate uh, integrate the physics uh, inside uh, inside the uh, machine learning systems? Okay. There was also this uh, this report by the Department of Energy. So this is an, well, it's, it, it's a big report with uh, a lot of information inside. And uh, in this report, they ex examine the, the potential of AI for many different domains. Okay, not not uh, not only uh, environment, but also for materials, for life science, uh, uh, medicine, and uh, okay, energy, and, uh, and so on. Okay, and they, they find they find out that there are many uh, many uh, similar similar questions in these uh, different domains for for the use of uh, AI. Okay, so for, for example, these questions that concern models, data, or infrastructures for model. Well, so, so there is always this, uh, this, uh, this question of uh, how to integ integrate uh, AI and, uh, and uh, prior knowledge from the from the application field. Okay. Uh, for data, for example, and, uh, probably mainly for for uh, life science and uh, medicine, there is this question of uh, data creation, data creation, and uh, and uh, and uh, Okay, how, how to create uh, data sets that could be shared and uh, used by uh, by different uh, different people and different uh, different researchers and different uh, different institutes. Okay, and also there is a question of uh, infrastructure, which is uh, related to the computing power, to the storing of the data, of the data, and, uh, and such. Okay, so here is a, uh, okay, an example from uh, from climate. An examples of some uh, of some of the questions and the, and the challenges. Okay, so typically for data, okay, in in, in uh, weather prediction and climate, there is this question of uh, how to of, of data acquisition. Okay, and uh, how, how to uh, how to collect the data, uh, how to uh, to use uh, what well, very. Uh, Heterogeneous and multiple sensors that are used to, to, to collect the data, how to store the data, and so on. Okay, for the models, there is still this uh, this question of integration of ML and uh, and uh, and, uh, and physics. Okay, through uh, through uh, simulators or emulators, and then there are different uh, challenges that are. Well, sort of specific to this field, like the data, data, data complexity. Even if you have a lot of data, uh, people often complain that it's too scarce. Okay, 
the data is extremely heterogeneous. Uh, you have a lot of, of noise. Uh, the, the data is collected on uh, multiple scales and so on. Okay. And there are these questions of the physical plausibility, validation, and so on. Okay. And here are some examples of uh, of uh, of, uh, of recent uh, recent initiatives. As soon as uh, 2019. Uh, some early initiatives uh, started in order to, to develop uh, like this one, the Climate Modeling Alliance between the different uh, different US, USA universities, with uh, with the goal of uh, developing new climate models, new climate models that would be uh, able to um, to incorporate since the beginning uh, machine learning and all the other techniques for 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 dealing with, uh, with data, and very recently there has been uh, uh, several publications. Okay, by the end of, uh, of last year and beginning of this year, there have been uh, several publications, mainly by by uh, by, uh, by people in uh, in big groups like uh, Google, Microsoft, and so on, about the applications of uh, foundation models for uh, for weather prediction. Okay. Okay, so here it's just a summary of the first question as I, I mentioned, and uh, now I will uh, I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, the integration of uh, physics with uh, machine learning and the problem of generalization. Okay. Okay. So one of the key question is uh, how to integrate uh, two different uh, Knowledge from uh, the two different paradigms, the physical paradigm and the machine learning paradigm. Okay. And I will illustrate it with uh, mainly uh, two, uh, two developments that uh, we, have, uh, we have produced. One is an, uh, probably our first attempt to, to, integrate, um, to integrate physics inside the machine learning systems. And it allows to deal uh, with integration when you have some uh, some background knowledge on the analytic form of uh, of the physical solution. And the other one is an extension of uh, of this uh, idea when uh, the background knowledge, the background physical knowledge, is uh, is uh, known under the form of uh, partial differential equations. And uh, the problem here is uh, how to integrate. Uh, uh, differential equation uh, solvers together with, uh, with machine learning models. Okay, and then I will illustrate an application to another domain, which is uh, cardiac hypothesis. Okay, okay. So here, well, let me do that. Okay. Well, no, it's not. Um... I don't, I, I don't know how to start this. Okay. Okay. So th this is uh, uh, for my first example. This is typically the type of uh, data we have been working on. So this data uh, uh, concerns the uh, sea surface uh, temperature for the North Atlantic. So it's a uh, simulated data, but it's uh, well quite uh, realistic that's been produced by, uh, by the NEMO engine, okay, which is, uh, NEMO is a new case for European uh, modeling of the, of the ocean. So it's part of, uh, of uh, different uh, climate models. Okay. So typically, this is the type of data we have, we are, we have been working on, okay, just uh, to show you the dynamics of the, of the temperature at the surface of the, of the, of the ocean. Okay, so when we want to, uh... okay, so the task we have been working on is the forecasting of uh, of, this, uh, of this dynamic. Okay, and uh, when we are using uh, machine learning, we, we we are not able to like in physics to model the rule. Uh, to, do, to, to develop model to develop models for the whole, uh, let's say, surface of, of the ocean. So typically, what we do is that uh, we take uh, we take the, the surface of the ocean. Okay, we uh, divide it into uh, different zones. Okay, 
and uh, what we what we do, what we want to do, is just to, to forecast uh, what happens in these uh, in these different regions. Okay. So typically, if I uh, if I consider one region here, okay, for example, this one here, okay, what I uh, what we will try to do is starting from initial state, okay, just to forecast what will what will happen in the, in the future. Okay. So this can be modeled through uh, this uh, well simple, or at least partly modeled through this uh, simple uh, simple equation. So this is a, a, a typical advection and diffusion equation. So here you have an advection term which is responsible for the for the global movement of the of the dynamics, and here you have a, you have a diffusion term. Here I is a quantity of interest. So typically here is a, this is a temperature. Okay, and uh, under some uh, assumptions, some simplified, simplified assumption, this uh, this equation has an analytical solution, and this analytical solution uh, could be open in closed form, and it says that the prediction at the next time step could, at, could be obtained from the from the observations at uh, at the current time step through a convolution with uh, with a kernel operator. And this kernel operator depends on this uh, W vector here, which is uh, which is a motion vector. Okay. So typically, if you know this motion vector, uh, you will be able to, to perform the to perform the forecast. But this uh, motion vector is uh, is unknown, okay, and it's uh, well, it's uh, usually it's quite complex to to uh, to estimate. And uh, typically, people are using uh, different models. To, to, to estimate this, this okay. So here is a simple scheme of uh, what, what we have been doing. So here you have uh, the observations from, from one zone, typically. Okay. And uh, we uh, this system describes uh, like probably uh, uh, a learning system that takes as input uh, past informations okay, or past observations. From, uh, from a given zone and try try uh, we'll try to predict what will, what will happen at uh, at, uh, at at the next uh, next time step. Okay, and the system is composed of two components. Here you have a neural network. Okay, and here you have what uh, what is called here a working scheme. And typically, this working scheme encode the, the the analytical solution, which is uh, described here. So this work this scheme here this part here. And code the physics, okay. And uh, this physics, in order to work, this physics requires uh, some parameters. The main one being this uh, motion vector, okay. And here, this uh, neural component is responsible for producing the, for producing this uh, this uh, this, uh, this component. Okay. So typically, the system is learned in a self-supervised way, which means that you just have to 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 use a, to use observation, okay. Uh, inputs and uh, and outputs here, and you will train your the wheel system in order to uh, to forecast the uh, next observation given uh, to forecast the future given uh, given the past. Okay, and uh, be because the, the two systems here are differentiable, you can you can you, you can uh, train them all together. And this means that uh, this uh, component here, this neural component, will produce something that will repro reproduce this uh, this uh, this motion, this motion. Okay. And typically, okay, here are some uh, some illustrations just to show that uh, well, more or less it uh, it works. Okay. So here you have the ground truth for some uh, for some steps. So you have an initial steps and the, and the steps uh, after this one. Okay. So here you have the prediction of the model. Here you have a classical numerical assimilation model. Okay. And here you have a baseline uh, neural networks without physics. So what can be seen from uh, these illustrations here is that uh, okay, if you use the machine learning without physics, it doesn't predict well. Okay. But when you use uh, well, the integration of physical machine learning, it uh, well, it is able to uh, to make uh, correct uh, correct predictions. So this is the qualitative uh, qualitative evaluation, and you find exactly the same thing when you do uh, 
uh, quantitative evaluations. For example, this model, which integrates uh, physics and machine learning, is, is uh, performs on par with uh, classical uh, classical numerical simulation. Okay. Okay. So this is uh, this was the first attempt. Uh, for uh, integrating physics and uh, and, uh, and machine learning, but uh, of course it uh, relied on a strong hypothesis, strong assumption, which is that uh, the, the physics was uh, available in a closed uh, analytical form. Okay, and uh, most of the time, if not always, it's not it's not possible. So uh, what we did uh, then as a, as a follow up of this of this work is to uh, more or less uh, develop the same idea, but uh, uh, by, by considering that the physics was uh, available in a form which is uh, more, more adequate for general modeling, and this form is a general, uh, general uh, partial differential equations. So typically, uh, we, have a, we want to model a given, a given phenomenon, okay? We have some information, Provided by a, a partial, partial differential equation. This uh, partial differential, the assumption is that the partial differential equation only provides uh, partial information about the uh, underlying ph phenomenon. And we want to complement this uh, phys physical info, uh, information through information extracted from the data by, uh, by the machine learning program. Okay. Okay, so this is just a, a illustration on the toy problem. So this toy problem is a, a damped pendulum. Okay, so here you have in red here on the left, you have an illustration of the dynamics of uh, the damped pendulum. So you have uh, well periodic oscillations, and the oscillations are, are damped. Okay, in time. Okay, in blue you you have what we would get with a pure machine learning problem. Okay? Here, well, again, you have the damp pendulum uh, dynamics, and in blue, you have what you get with an imperfect physical model. And this imperfect uh, physical model is simply uh, corresponds simply to the equation of the pendulum, but with without uh, da without uh, damping uh, damping term. Okay. So this because it is incomplete, it is, it is unable to uh, to. Uh, Forecast the correct dynamics, or to model the correct dynamics. Okay, and here you are. What you want to, what you want to get by combining both uh, the incomplete physical model and uh, and uh, uh, machine learning, machine learning component. Okay, so this is exactly the, the objective. Okay. So again, just I I repeat the general framework. We consider that. Uh, Physics provides a partial knowledge about an underlying phenomenon. Okay, this partial knowledge provided under the form of uh, partial differential equations. Well, and uh, we want to complement this uh, this uh, physical knowledge with uh, information extracted from uh, observations from data. Okay, and we do that by uh, by combining the physical model with uh, machine machine learning. Okay, so typically we consider uh, a gen very general dynamics of the following uh, of the following form. Okay, so here the f function includes the dynamic; it's a, an unknown function. Okay, and we consider that uh, uh, we have uh, the two components I mentioned before. One is a physics component, and uh, the other one is a machine learning component. And we want to uh, model these dynamics. According to this kind of uh, decomposition, okay, so the unknown dynamics here will be modeled as uh, the sum of two uh, of two two components. One corresponds to physics, and the other one corresponds uh, corresponds to uh, to information extracted by uh, through, through machine learning. Okay? So this is a very general setting, and this is a simple uh, additive combination. But uh, well, it's uh, it, 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 it's simple, but it's also very general. I mean, uh, in, a, in a vectorial function space, you can decompose more or less all the all the uh, all this all the function in this in this way. Okay. Okay. So uh, we are looking for a solution that can be expressed as a as a sum of two of, of the physical and the machine learning component. Okay. Well, uh, unfortunately. Uh, 
the, this problem is ill posed, uh, which means that uh, given uh, an, unknown, uh, an unknown dynamics, there are many different uh, possible decisions. So what we, what we did is we tried to uh, rephrase the problem in uh, this ill posed problem into a well, well posed problem. And so I will just give you the intuition behind the, behind the solution. The intuition is that uh, the physics, the physical component, should be a good approximation of the, of the underlying and underlying key. Okay? So it's supposed to be a good approximation of this input. So we want this uh, uh, physical component to explain as much of the dynamics as possible. And we want the machine learning component to act just as a complement of, uh, of the information that the physical component cannot, uh, can attack, cannot, uh, cannot model. Okay, so we want to uh, well, say, say otherwise, we want uh, the machine learning component uh, to explain only the residual information that cannot be explained by the, by the, the physical one. Okay, so this can be form uh, formalized as, a, as an optimization problem. So uh, we won't detail the optimization problem, but it just, just says that we want this model this sum of the, the two components here to model correctly the dynamics, okay? And uh, here we want the, the machine learning component just to, to model the, the residual that cannot be explained by the, by the physics, okay? And uh, by uh, writing the, the problem this way, uh, we, we, have, we have transformed the kill post problem into, into a well, uh, well post uh, well post problem and, and under some mild conditions. Uh, this problem uh, uh, as, a, as a solution, okay, as a solution that decomposes into uh, two components and the, this, uh, this solution uh, is unique. Un okay. okay, so uh, typically, uh, the practical, for, for the practical instantiation, the physical component is modeled as a differential equation. The machine learning component is, uh, is modeled as a, as, a, as a neural network. And uh, we solve an uh, integral version of this, uh, of this optimization problem, which means that uh, we'll be able to solve this optimization problem by learning through the observations of, uh, of trajectories. Okay. Okay, the, the observation of trajectories, uh, I mean, of uh, special, special temporal, special temporal uh, trajectories of, uh, of the ocean. Okay. So just to, to summarize this, uh, this approach, so we have observation and uh, we have a, a model which combines in a simple way, uh, physical components and uh, machine learning components. And uh, says uh, two components are, mod uh, are combined in order to, to optimize the problem and this, uh, and this, uh, this problem will be uh, optimized through uh, well, a general, uh, general uh, solver for, for ordinary uh, differential equation. Okay. So just to show you uh, well, a simple example how it works. So here, this is, an, this is a, a, simple, a simple reaction diffusion equations in two, in two dimensions. Okay. So you have uh, two components. One uh, is a different component here. Okay, this is this part, and uh, one concerns uh, the reaction. So the incomplete uh, incomplete model uh, here uh, consists of exactly the same uh, this uh, this, uh, this same system, except that we have removed the the, the reaction component. Okay. So this is uh, the simple model, the physical uh, physical uh, background here uh, is represented by, uh, by the, the, the diffusion by diffusion system. Okay. So here, uh, so it's a two dimensional problem. So you have two components. Okay. So here you have a representation representations of two components, and uh, you have uh, different snap snapshots here that uh, corresponds to. Uh, to a, to, to a given dynamics, okay, so given initial, initial states, okay, we just uh, let uh, unroll the, the dynamics, and this corresponds to the ground truth. And here to uh, to, to to the modeling, uh, which is uh, which is provided by uh, by this simple physical model, 
Okay. So you can see that it doesn't work well. It doesn't produce this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this dynamics. And here you have exactly the same. Uh, you, have, you have the dynamics that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is forecast by the, the combined uh, physics, physical and, uh, and machine learning model. OK? OK, so I will just, uh, so I don't know how much time I've, uh, I've left. Yeah. Right. yeah, it would be good to rather wrap, uh, wrap, up, wrap up, I think. But yeah, so maybe five minutes is good. Five minutes? OK. So I, I, just, I, will, I will just show you uh, an application to a different domain. So it's an application to a, to a completely different domain, which is a cardiac electric, the modeling of cardiac, cardiac electrography. Okay. And uh, here, for example, we have a complex model that provides, uh, that provides, um, that provides the high, high fidelity, uh, high fidelity, fidelity simulations. But this model is, is expensive and it's expensive to run. And it's a complex model with uh, around uh, 40, 40 variables. Okay. And people uh, very often use a simple model, simple model with uh, only a few variables that are, are much more, much, much more fast uh, to operate. Okay. So here we, it, it's uh, just an application of the, of the, of the previous idea. And uh, this, uh, this application, okay, for this application, we consider that the complex model. We consider the complex models as a target uh, as a, as a target uh, target dynamics okay as a, and uh, the simple model here as the incomplete uh, physical uh, physical background okay so it's exactly the same idea except, except that it is, uh, it is it's developed for, for another for application and typically typically here it's uh, just uh, to illustrate a, a simulation of uh, the cardiac uh, electrography, okay, on a slab of uh, on a slab of uh, cardiac tissue, with uh, so, so it's a, a small small slab with uh, twenty four by twenty four elements. So here you just uh, this is an initial state, and here you have a you have a, you have a, the dynamics, okay, which is a, which is an unroll which corresponds to the ground truth. And here you have the dynamics which is generated by uh, by this model, this combined this, con this combined model. So it's just uh, and, and again it's the same uh, same uh, same idea as uh, as before. It works uh, it, well. It's, uh, the machine learning model is able to correct the the the, the physical part, and uh, and it is uh, and it works much better than uh, when using. Uh, I mean, using the Google Mind model was much better than using, uh, using uh, a, a single machine, a single machine learning model. Okay. Okay. So I, I will just try to, to highlight some uh, so some ideas about uh, the problem of uh, of generalization. So I, I won't uh, I won't go into, into detail. Okay. I will just uh, take some minutes to to explain. Uh, to explain uh, our vision of, uh, of this problem. So, what is uh, what is uh, generalization? Uh, generalization is a key issue. It is uh, that uh, this key issue conditions the uh, usability of uh, machine learning for 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 scientific uh, scientific applications. Okay, and typically here you have an example. So, this is an example of the sea surface temperature prediction. Okay, so I, what I told you is that. Uh, uh, Typically, what we do in machine learning, we, we divide the neural machine into uh, into different different zones, and we learn to forecast on the, on the different uh, on each uh, on, on, on the different uh, on the different uh, on the different zones. So what we will do is that we'll take uh, here some of the zones in in order to uh, in order to train to train the models. And then we uh, we expect that the model will be able to generalize on the on the other part of the ocean, but of course it doesn't generalize well. And you have many uh, many different uh, different problems like uh, like this one, for example, here. Well, it's, it's, it's exactly the, the same idea, except that it's uh, for the for the modeling of, uh, of epidemics. 
So here this data corresponds to the data for to the, to the COVID data. So the idea is exactly, exactly the same. You have uh, and, and the different curves here correspond to different uh, correspond to different country uh, for for a given period. Okay. So the the idea is exactly the same. Uh, you have one underlying process. This underlying process is exactly is, is the same. Okay, for all the different countries, but depending on the context, I mean, uh, depending on the well, on the on the social economic context, for example, or on the on the on the physical localization of the country and so on. Okay, the dynamics will be will not be will not be the same. And you have the same thing. We have exactly the same thing for biomedical applications. Okay, so for example, when you go into models uh, dynamics and uh, well, like the examples I, I mentioned before, before the dynamics of uh, the, the electrical uh, e e dynamics of the electrical activity of the earth, for example, you have different dynamics for the different patients. Okay. Well, so what's uh, what's the idea of uh, of uh, dealing with uh, generalization and uh, why do uh, pure machine learning models uh, do not uh, generalize well for complex for when modeling complex uh, physical problems? Okay, so the, 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 the usual, usual way to to handle uh, to handle uh, generalization for machine learning is to gather as much data as possible. Okay. Usually, these data are collected uh, from uh, different environments or from different contexts. And then you shuffle all the data, okay, and you train your system on this, on this shuffled data. Okay. Well, so the classical assumption in, uh, in machine learning is, uh, is a high idea assumption, which, which means that uh, the data for training and tests we have exactly the same uh, the same uh, the same distribution, but this is uh, this is wrong in in many cases. And uh, as I, I mentioned before, for 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 the modeling of uh, dynamical system, it's uh, well, it, it, it's uh, it's a completely completely wrong assumption. I mean, the, usually it's, uh, the dynamics are are much 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 uh, much too complex to uh, to collect enough data to represent all the all the different. Uh, Possible, uh, possible occurrences. Okay. Well, so uh, for domain generalization, uh, we make an assumption, and this uh, this assumption is uh, is the following. Okay, is that we consider the data from several domains. The different domains we share some commonalities. For example, the general form of the dynamics. Okay. So typically, for example, uh, there's uh, there's uh, the different data observed in, uh, from different environment we share the dynamics but it will, it will correspond for example to a parametric uh, parametric uh, partial differential equations and the parameters or the initial states or uh, well, or, well any, or different variables from the, the dynamics will change from one environment to zero to zero, to zero to environment so this is this is the the, the idea okay and uh, so the, the general uh, general idea for domain generalization is to explicitly leverage this knowledge and the existence of uh, different environments, okay, for uh, trying to uh, to generalize uh, to generalize data. Okay. And uh, so I will not describe uh, we have not enough time. So I will not I will not describe the the well. Different work we did in, into, into, in this domain, but by using this uh, idea of uh, leveraging uh, leveraging the the knowledge collected in the in the different environment and the and the sheer knowledge that uh, we have different environments. Okay, what we what we developed uh, are uh, methods. Okay, that allow to uh, interpolate. Two different environments, which means that uh, we are able to learn in uh, the different environment, and by considering considering that there are different, different improves of performance in these uh, different uh, different environments. Okay, and uh, we have uh, as a follow up of this work, we have developed uh, methods that are able to extrapolate to extrapolate to uh, to um, to conditions 
or to environments that have, have uh, never been seen during the during the, the training during the training. Okay. Okay, so uh, I was too long. I will not uh, I will go directly to the conclusion. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, so this is the conclusion. Okay. So uh, about uh, about uh, a combination of uh, of machine learning and, uh, and physics. So machine learning has a brings a lot of advantages. Okay. Uh, the combinations of uh, machine learning and, uh, and physics, uh, well, it's not it's not a new domain, but uh, well, as I mentioned, uh, it uh, grew considerably uh, starting uh, by starting only a few a few years ago. Okay, uh, something which is uh, extremely interesting is that uh, usually uh, people are trying to to communicate and to work to, together across uh, across uh, different communities. And uh, well, it uh, it has already uh, produced uh, well very int very interesting re results. Like the one, for example, that I, I mentioned uh, in the introduction uh, for uh, for weather prediction or large size uh, climate applications. Okay, but uh, right now I think we are only at the, at the beginning of this uh, of this development. Okay. Uh, our practice is that uh, there is still a, a huge gap between uh, academic developments, like the one I just uh, showed you, and uh, practical implementa implementations. So typically, we have been working on, uh, well, uh, on, uh, on different applications, and each time, uh, is a simple applications of the ideas that's just uh, like the one that's just described doesn't uh, is not enough. Okay, you have to bring uh, other information. From the application the application domains or from the from the physics, okay, and uh, there's uh, there's developments, okay, for uh, for uh, well for bringing uh, uh, physics aware uh, machine learning to the stage of uh, practical app applications requires a lot of, uh, of still a lot of effort. And uh, a lot of uh, interdisciplinary uh, effort. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's it for me. Thanks a lot uh, for the presentation. Maybe you can actually go to your references because if the talk uh, the talk uh, talk is uh, re um, recorded, and so people can also maybe have a look at that at that slide with references. Uh, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. thanks, th thanks a lot. Uh, I mean, this was really a very nice uh, tool, to very nice uh, and complementary perspectives, and I think they have really this common ground, which is basically the, the lambda parameter, <laughs> kind of the regularization in, in one or one or the other way. <laughs> I believe uh, I would have some questions there, but uh, there's first a question by Michael Speiser. Um, the question is basically: Are these approaches? Also possible when the ground truth system has a stochastic component. I think it's to you, Patrick. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. So what I have shown here is uh, only uh, you're right. It's only for deterministic uh, deterministic forecasting. Okay. So and uh, so, so something we, we, we do not uh, we do not uh, well, we are not used to uh, to to do in machine learning and uh, this is a question I always have from when I talk with uh, with uh, with physicists is uh, about the modeling of uh, uncertainty okay well so it is, this is a, an extremely uh, important issue and uh, well I, I think. Uh, from the machine learning perspective, and from people from uh, from machine learning, well, this, this, has, this has not been uh, really uh, really developed for uh, for, some, for, for, for the modeling of uh, for the modeling of physics. Okay, so there are many different ways to to do that, but uh, for physics, it does not been, uh, really uh, well. People have have, have not uh, really uh, seen seriously about this problem. Okay. 
Now, uh, as for for your for, for your question about uh, stochastic component, uh, well, uh, we are able to uh, to model stochasticity. Okay, uh, for uh, for different applications. Personally, I, I uh, have not uh, been working on that for physics, but for some things. So I'm sorry, but some things which from uh, my, my point of view, which is quite close to, to what, what I just described, which is uh, the, the forecasting for, for videos, okay? Not, uh, not for spatial temporal, uh, spatial temporal dynamics, but uh, for let's say YouTube videos, okay? Uh, the best, uh, let's say, forecasters are stochastic predictors, okay? Well, so I don't know if it, if it uh, completely answers your question, but uh, well, yes, we, we are able to. Okay, P people have started to, to to develop models that that integrate some form of, uh, of stochasticity. Okay, and in, in the same way, I mean, uh, there are recently there has been a, a lot of work on the on the on the use and modeling of uh, stochastic uh, stochastic differential equations. So it's uh, but, uh, for other, other types of applications. Okay, yes. So I, I would actually have one question that goes to you, but then a related question to, to Laura. Um, so basically, um, in, in your approach on the uh, decomposing basically the, the differential equation into two additive terms, one, one is physical and the other one is kind of the rest, um, um, which is described as a neural network. I, did you? I have about two questions actually. Did you? Did I understand correctly that you could show mathematically the, uh, that there's a there's a proof uh, that through the regularization with a norm, it gets identifiable? Uh, so one question, and then the second question: Is this true uh, only? Only is this true only for additive, or would it be uh, for any uh, addition like multiplicative or, or other ways of integrating the neural network there in a nonlinear way? Well. Um... Okay, as for the proof, okay. Uh, it would be nice if there's a proof, <laughs> because that's basically... Yeah, yeah, had yeah, a yeah. Guarantee, I had a guarantee on that, this is really nice. <laughs> yes, yes. W w what I could say is that uh, we have guarantees, okay, under some uh, mild uh, hypothesis that uh, you are able to do this decomposition and to, uh, to infer the correct parameters for the physical parts, okay? And uh, and to have uh, and have a unique uh, unique composition between the between the two terms. Okay, so I have a proof, but uh, well, it's uh, well, I mean, it's, uh, well, a formal proof. Okay, it's a formal proof I made. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to say that uh, this formal proof doesn't mean much for practical applications. Okay. So if we, if we have this theoretical proof. We're glad to have uh, to have this proof. It's better than nothing, okay? But uh, well, first it's, uh, it works only under under these assumptions, okay? The assumptions that uh, you know uh, at least part of the of the of the physical model, okay? Even if uh, okay, if uh, it uh, you know it up to some to some parameters. And you want uh, the machine learning model uh, just to to to, to complete uh, to complete the physical model, okay? okay. Well, yeah. and I and the last I, I forgot the, the second part. Of oh, the, the other question: part. if it's if the decomposition not is not linear, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yes. Well, in fact, this linear decomposition is uh, well. You, you, you can get exactly the same type of research with other compositions, okay? But uh, this uh, additive decomposition is very general, okay? Yeah. So, you, well, again, it's for, for a proof, you can show that in a general vector space, you always uh, uh, can have this, uh, this type of decomposition. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes, so maybe it's a kind of related question to, to Laura. I mean, you, you showed the symbolic uh, regression approach, and, uh, and of course, uh, when one can for me, the question is also you explore really a huge function space at the end, uh, so it's not, not so different from deep learning, but then you regularize it also with a, with a, uh, with a lambda parameter and the parsimony principle. I'm wondering uh, if you have, what are the, your, your heuristics or to tune this hyperparameter on, on the parsimony, uh, basically? 
Yeah, that's a great question and, and definitely also relate to some of, of Patrick's work. I guess we have no proofs. Uh, so we really went at it in a more kind of heuristic way or tried to you know, go after something that made sense. So it, it was, in all honesty, I mean, I think for us, the majority of the, I don't want to call it tuning, but I think everything goes into the preparation of the data. That has been kind of the most sensitive part of our problem uh, to begin with more than anything on how we how we actually tune the you know the the lambda parameter to make actually the model person minus that has actually been the less sensitive part but the way we actually deal with the data to begin with so again because we are learning a residual term so you know the way we filter and cross grain actually had more impact on our results than than you know the tuning parameter to actually find a model that is passed it was a bit of a surprise to some extent, and yeah. and then after the fact became almost obvious uh, yeah. that as long as you get the right physics, then you know the first yeah. few terms will be identical. But it depends very much on how you extract this residual. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So we have maybe one last question. Then actually, uh, um, I hear also from the organizers we need to close it. Um, it's also to Laura. Um, it's an interesting question. Also, I think it's about. Um, the point that climate data seems to be very uh, sparse or well at all, many zeros i don't know if it really is sparse is the right term and and uh, machine learning models do not work well with such heavily skewed data so that's maybe the point uh, if you think about for example precipitation i guess for example well, what are the techniques you use to handle those cases with very skewed data yeah that's a good question so so i think for us a lot of it has been you know, trying to, I mean, yes, so everything will be in the loss function that you use to some extent, right? So you can either transform your loss to actually try to capture something that has, you know, kind of a different distribution that becomes skewed. Second option is something we've been actually kind of trying out is actually to transform the data so it becomes more Gaussian. And there are quite a few examples. I mean, Marcus, you just mentioned precipitation, and there are a few papers who actually did that without machine learning just to literally try to retransform the probabilities. So then you end up with something that actually is more normally distributed. And so those are kind of a couple of things that we've been playing with to, to definitely kind of address that problem. It's a very good question, yeah. Good, so I think we close this seminar. Thanks a lot again, Patrick and Laura for, for these really Thank nice you. talks with very different uh, perspectives on, on a very similar problem. So I, th I hope everyone I'm sure everyone <laughs> learned quite a lot from those talks and uh, and uh, they can be also re-listened um, based on YouTube, which uh, is, I think, also very good. So one can think about it again. <laughs> so, Thank yeah, you. thanks thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for participating in today's AI for Good session. We hope you've learned something new, innovative, and engaging in today's event. We now encourage you to continue the conversation on the live video wall in the neural network. Here you can ask questions, like and comment, share links, complete the poll, connect with interesting profiles, or speak one-on-one -on -one using the chat and video function. We invite you to explore the lobby, try the smart matching quiz, visit the virtual exhibits, poster boards, the eShop, and build your personalized AI for Good program. Let's shape the future of AI for Good. AI is a powerful tool. summit can help ensure that artificial intelligence charts a course that benefits humanity and bolsters our shared values.